Yes, so hello everyone and welcome to this presentation on the topic of the graphic in the golden age of illustration. First of all, once again, thank you Sam for making this amazing group and you know this amazing project and space of exchange on knowledge, art and history. So I'll start by Ooh, introducing myself. So for those of you who might not know me, my name is Najah. I'm an art historian, I'm an archivist, as well as a podcaster. And this is my podcast, uh, Imaginarium of Alternate History of Art, where I explore the lesser known subjects of art history. And like I said earlier, just anything that piques my fancy. So when I was thinking about the subject for this talk, I had just finished writing all the scripts for my second season on the topic of the golden age. So I thought it would be really fun to investigate the topic of the Delphic during that era and in the world of illustration in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, notably in fairy tales and children's books and exploring a bit how children's literature often dealt with darker subjects and the way those were illustrated and pictured. So during the, the late 19th century and early 20th century. But we hopefully will explore a lot of things today. Of course, as I am an art historian, this will be a very picture and visuals heavy presentation. So I hope this will make for a fun time for everyone. So first of all, what is the golden age? Before we get to talking about the subject of the Gothic, one has to define what the golden age is. So it's a period of roughly 50 years between the 1870s and the 1920s. And it's an age of vibrant creativity and technological advancement in the world of print. It was the peak of the use of illustration in everything from illustration from advertisements, ornamentation, books, magazine, posters, decor, really, you name it. So it was that key period to before the start of photography and cinema and you know photography and cinema was, was starting to happen during the late 19th century but it was still not available not the way illustration was illustration it's it was cheap to print and really easy to distribute as well it was a golden age also because of how valued the artists were not, not everyone, of course, but a lot of them were paid handsomely. So as I said, the historical context of the golden age was one where the technological progress made it possible to print easily and very quickly, as well as in the mass quantity to keep up with, with the demands for births. So this becomes something that just was extremely easy to do. The artist would simply sketch and draw something really quickly and print it almost as immediately. Of course, the, the dates often vary from historian to historian. I chose 1870 because it was the most, uh, the most sad date, but also because this book, which is the first example of a fairy tale storybook, was published in 1869. So, in Fairyland, a series of pictures from the elf world by Richard Doyle really feels like the start of that era. So, the, it's the work of art that really kickstarts an era of fairy fantasy, eeriness, and utter creativity. The age of the golden age is well known for its incredible visual diversity. It is an age where several movements and art styles develop and emerge and at the same time, all influencing and informing each other. The rapid development of the publishing industry is also another factor of the, develop, the fast developing market of illustration as it was growing in tandem. So one of the strongest influences on the artists of the golden age of illustration is the movements of the arts and crafts in the second half of the 20th of the 19th century and was helmed by William Morris. It was a movement that was trying to be a counterpoint to the rapid and extreme industrialization and mass production of the time and wanted to offer an alternate way of life and thinking. And when something it's 
when something happens, there is very often an opposite reaction to it. It's just an almost certain way of life. When there's extreme conservatism, you'll have it progressism and you know, vice versa. So you can see it's a very familiar idea. We can see it now with the movement of credit tour and the slow life movement. So when it comes to the arts and crafts, it was really in response to that mass production and industrialization. It was also a natural response to the social anxieties of the time. There was a lot of, in a world that was changing extremely rapidly and at a speed that was never reached before. There was a lot of illustrations and ornamentations that were inspired by nature. And that's without even mentioning the rise of botanical illustrations and countryside inspired art such as Beatrix Potter or Kate Greenway. Kate Greenway was one of the premier artists of the golden age. She drew very beautiful art inspired by the idealized imagine, imagined vision of the rural life. So you can see those three young girls. This is a piece of art by Kate Greenway. Her art is absolutely very cute. Another component of the arts and crafts was that they thought that the craftsmanship of factory made item wasn't up to par compared to handmade crafted objects and really advocated for well made quality objects when one could really appreciate the work and design put into creating it. This movement really was the heartbeat and a lot of movements in, in this era and ended up putting a lot of groundwork for the subsequent art styles of the, of the late 19th century. It's a mindset that would become very incredibly influential. And as you can see in this uh, slide, those are examples of pattern making from the arts and crafts. And these are from the daughter of William Morris. So the influence of the natural motif was thus a mainstay in the arts of the late 19th century and was going on even in the movement of Art Nouveau, which was very prevalent in the 1890s and the 1900s with representative artists such as Alphonse Mucha, who was one of the main illustrators of the movement and was illustrating a lot of posters and calendars and had his work printed in extremely high number, which shows not only his personal success, but also the way illustration was, a, was an integral part of capitalism and marketing. Like the arts and crafts, like you can see, it places a lot of emphasis on the natural world and using very loopy and curved lines as a call back to the organic lines found in nature. So the illustrations on the top and the middle with the one with the calendar are from the artist uh, Eugène Grasset, who did a lot of commercial work as well, and who wrote in 1896 the book, Plants and their Applications to Ornament, just to show how important the natural motif was in the golden age of illustration. The last uh, illustration in the bottom left corner is by Fujima Takeji, which is a Japanese painter in art during the art movie movement. And it's just a reminder that the world was always a global one, which is through art and that art and culture travels and through exchange, communication, and also, you know, colonialism as well. But we have to, in this case, remember that Japan, despite being a non-white country, was also an imperialist power. So there's a lot of nuances to be had in that conversation. Nonetheless, I just think it's a very striking piece that really has all the tenets of the movement of Art Nouveau, the warm color, the delicate curves, and the very important focus on the natural world. So, so all of this to say that what distinguishes the golden age of illustration is its place within the market, from posters to magazine covers, which, by the way, here are some lovely examples from the late 19th century all the way to the 1920s, which demonstrate the, high, the wide var variety of art styles during those 50 years. So here are some more examples of art, especially toward the later years of the golden age, namely the 1920s. 
where the art was becoming more streamlined and where the focus was more on the line rather than the colors and the more painterly style of the late 19th century due to the influences of art deco. So now that we have a bit of a rapid overview of the golden age of illustrations, we can get a bit more in depth into the world of graphic during those years. Just a second. So here are some more. So one of the key parts of the golden age of illustration is the role of fairy tales and folklore and children's book. That during those years, there were countless fairy tales and folklore that were revamped and republished and re-edited, as well as the importation of quote-unquote exotic tales such as the Arabian Nights or Chinese tales. And so these books were published and also illustrated for the viewing of both an adult public, but also for geared toward a younger audience of children. So I'll just present the two different styles of illustration that you could have to illustrate those stories. So you could have this sort of st art style that is extremely heavy on the line and the use of black and white to create the image. Or you could have this sort of style that is more colorful and painted more often than not in watercolors to create a very ethereal and enchanting atmosphere. So these two illustrations are from the tale of Sleeping Beauty. The one on the right is from Edmond Gillard and the one on the left is from John Duncan. I'll just let you look a bit at it if you want, but these are extremely beautiful illustrations. The artists in the golden age were extremely talented. But what is important to understand during those, the, during this era is that there are two different uh, visions of childhood that really get cemented. So you have the pretty and lovely innocent pictures of a vision of an age when nothing can go wrong and the parents are loving and caring and there's a lot of toys and friends around and nothing can go wrong, everything is happy. So these illustrations are from the Dutch illustrator, Henriette Wilbert Lemire, who, and all of her illustrations are on the same vein. So very soft colors, very small scenes of everyday life. And she has a really lovely universe that shows uh, how childhood was starting to be viewed. It is the age where people really try to codify the raising of children and to protect the innocence of children by not, you know, confronting them to art or stories that aren't appropriate for their ages. So as I said, during the late, during the late 19th century is when a lot of the original quote unquote um, fairy tales were rewritten and re-edited to be more appropriate to a younger public, such as the Andrew Lyne versions of the story. And I use the word original very lightly here because as fairy tales are largely from the oral tradition, this means there's no really any original story. It's just different iterations of the same story over and over again, and no one is more correct than the other. So that version of childhood is not the only one that there is, though. There is the other side of the coin that accepts and encourages the fact that children are often curious and taken in by the darkness in life, by those more eerie tales and those stories that have a sense of the horrifying and the monstrous and the unsettling. As we are all in a project called Romancing the Gothic, I feel like we have all been interested in those types of stories as children I know I was. So instead of the, and the artists of the era were also exploring those types of stories. So instead of going for the more sanitized, perfect, nothing can go wrong stories, they explore the gothic and frightful side of human nature, of the tales we tell each other to explain the unexplained, to warn about dangers and the fairies that will steal away children uh, or dark beasts for husbands. So 
So we'll start by a contemporary example of what I mean. So these are the covers of series of unfortunate events by author Lemony Snicket. And it really embodies, I think, this desire to have a bit more darker stories where things can go wrong and children live in worlds that are not kind to them and not everything is rosy. And the cover art for these stories, for these books are by American artist Brett Helquist. And they do capture very nicely the way, even though this is geared towards children, toward the younger audience, sometimes terrible stuff can happen. We also can see, I think, definitely the visual influence from the golden age of illustration in those cover arts, from the colors, the lines, and the composition. I think it is a, a very good follow-up to the masters of the golden age. Arthur Rotham is a British illustrator of the later years of the 19th century, and he was extremely successful, but he went a different route with his art than the usual, creating a pictorial universe that contrasting that with the more childish and warm illustrations of the era did not feel as safe. The monsters are scary, the woods seem creepy and uninviting. And I would argue that Arthur Rotham was not only a fairy tale illustrator, but was also the first fantasy illustrator of the time, who seemed to revel in creating bizarre and weird, while still giving those images an air of realism and rounding them in the plausible, with the use of a very earthy color palette. You can see on the left this illustration of Alice in Wonderland, and I think this is also a clear example of the Victorian love for the slightly eerie and weird stories, but also children's love for things that are a bit wacky and slightly weird. So here are some more examples of Arthur Beckham's art, which really captures the sensation of something being wrong with dark shadows and lurking in the woods and are following you on your adventures. So visually, the era of the Golden Age codified a lot of the visuals we commonly associate with the Gothic or with, even with fairy tales, from the stark black and white art to the shadows and the archetype of the witch. So it is at that moment that a lot of the way visually we imagine fairy tales really got cemented. So let me talk about one of my favorite artists of this era. So this is Kay Nelson. He is a Danish illustrator that is an incredibly prominent artist of the golden age, especially toward the later part of the era, more toward the 19-teens and the 1920s. He illustrated several classic fairy tales uh, as well as a compilation of stories from the North. So the two on the left, are from the Tales of the Twelve Dancing Princesses, and the one on the right is from the Tales of the North. I think Kane Nielsen has a strong talent for portraying very vivid and highly stylized, larger than life characters. He portrays queens and cursed princes, mysterious adventurers, and magical beings. His art is escapist and, escapist and full of wonder, and I just think his work of art is absolutely marvelous. We'll talk about this particular series in from the Book of Death, published in that was first exhibited in 1912 in London. So shortly up, up after his arrival in the series in the city. And while they were never published in book form, which is sad, it is still an incredibly beautiful series of narrative illustration and art. It's a series of 10 illustrations that followed the stories of Piero being overwhelmed by sadness over the death of his beloved. So these illustrations follow the, um, the, follow the devast devastating emotions of loss, grief, and mourning, and they are absolutely striking and heartbreaking. He has a very intricate line work, and that definitely takes inspiration by the artists that preceded him and such as Aubrey Birdsley. 
So the elegance and delicateness of this line was, it's just so lovely in my opinion. And I can, think we can all agree on how graphic it, it is with the stark contrast, the black and white and the personification of death being such an incredibly important character. Now, welcome to one of the most graphic authors of the 19th century. So a certain Edgar Allan Poe, whose work is now a classic work of literature. So Poe's writing dealt with the grotesque, the monstrous and the terrifying, and the art that was used to illustrate those stories reflected that. It, these stories were illustrated by many artists and the themes of Poe's work fit nice, neatly with the ones that were circulating during the late 19th century, especially with the moral panic and society's anxiety um, about the degeneration of society and British culture. Of course, the gothic world of Poe really lends itself really well to themes and to these themes and societal worries. And it is something that these artists of this decade really explored a lot. Well, so I'll have to edit it. So Harry Clark, which is an, uh, who is an uh, Irish artist, explored and who worked a lot in illustration as well as in stained glass, did this series of illustrations for Poe's Tales of Mysteries and Imagination in 1919. Clark, his art is disturbing and slightly eerie in my opinion. Clark explores the morbid and in a way that is both scary and incredibly delicate and intricate. Beauty is terror and Clark understands it intrinsically in his illustrations. Those images do not shy away from using large black, large black washes of ink and to contrast with the characters and scenes that are depicted. Clark was not the only one artist to take dark subjects as well as a source of inspiration during the 19-teens and the 1920s, as it was an era of interest toward the ghost stories and the esoteric and mummy curses. So there was a general fascination with the themes of death and of the supernatural during the later years of the 19th century and until the 1920s. So illustrated with pictures and ornaments. So this is the stories of Bluebird. And I think this is one of the most graphic fairy tales that there is out there. There is, it is a solid graphic romance. There is a mysterious husband, an isolated dark castle and a door that you have been forbidden to ever open. And those illustrations by Joseph E. Sothall really give this feeling of an eerie story being told, but it's also an example of the kind of illustration that were being done during the later years of the 19th century. The book can be seen as an object of art in itself to be decorated and pretty and ornamented and really worked on as if you were working on a painting. I think the nature in itself of a fairy tale can be very graphic, but this black and white illustration, engraved illustration of Sleeping Beauty by Gustave Doe, I really do heighten this fact for me. The use of the black and white of the shadows and the contrast between the shabby, deserted and overgrown castle with by the wild nature and the princess in her bed really heightened the narrative emotion for me. So the golden age of illustration was a, a highly stylized and was an era of highly stylized art and unbridled creativity. But within the colorful art and of Art Nouveau and magazine covers and lies a world of fairy tales of dark woods in which to get lost and where dreams and nightmares in the light. And here we are done. And Thank you so much for this uh, talk and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.